Hello, good afternoon and very welcome to this open seminar on Plan S. Uh, my name is Anna Lundén and I'm heading a division at the National Library of Sweden working with negotiating with publishers and also coordinating open access to research publication. So therefore I was very honoured to be asked by Astrid Söderberg-Widding and Wilhelm Widmark to moderate this session where all the researchers at Stockholm University can have an open dialogue about this um, seminar or about Plan S. Uh, the agenda for today you've seen seen it in this uh, invitation. Uh, Astrid Söderberg-Widding will start with a short introduction and then we have uh, David Sweeney, the Executive Chair of Research England and the Co-Chair of the Implementation Task Force for Plan S, who will give a short presentation and uh, have a Q&A session directly after that. I should also point that this seminar is being recorded and will be published afterwards because there's an interest all over Europe about your questions. Uh, after this, David Sweeney will leave us uh, around quarter to three, and then we will continue with Astrid Söderberg-Widding giving a statement, followed by Professor Erik Lindahl and uh, our library director, Wilhelm Widmark. And after those three statements, there will be a new Q&A for you to ask questions and give us your reflections. So with that said, I'm welcoming Astrid Söderberg-Widding. Thank you, Anna. Uh, just a very short word of welcome, a warm welcome to all of you to this seminar on Plan S. Uh, Plan S or Coalition S is indeed a hot topic today for researchers, uh, university leaderships and uh, publishers alike, nationally and internationally, but not least also for the finances who by Plan S uh, have been put into focus. Uh, I strongly believe that it is important to have open discussions within academia in matters so absolutely crucial and obviously also in certain respects so controversial as this one. And that is why we have arranged this open seminar here at Stockholm University. So a warm welcome and back to our moderator. Yes, and now the tech team... Uh, has made it possible for uh, David Sweeney to be with us uh, via link. And as I said in the introduction, he's the executive chair of Research England and currently the co-chair of this implementation task force for Plan S, together with John Arne Röttingen, chief executive at the Research Council of Norway. So the floor is yours, sweet Mr. Sweeney. It's a privilege to be talking to you. It'd be even more of a privilege to be able to join you as I really do enjoy visiting uh, Stockholm, both for work and uh, for pleasure. Uh, thank you for inviting me. Uh, I'll make a brief opening statement. What I think is not controversial is the aim of full and immediate open access, uh, something that uh, lots of people have been working for for over 20 years and indeed the ministers in the European Union agreed on the 1st of January 2020 as the date uh, some years ago. I think it's fair to say that open access is failing to achieve that target. Uh, the uptake is relatively slow and perhaps has stalled and it has proved costly. So we have an issue of public policy uh, something that I think is desirable for many reasons for science and research that has failed. The aim of Coalition S in developing this plan is, is uh, to revitalize the push to full and immediate open access. That is our aim. Uh, it is our aim to have that as the uh, full and open access as the predominant model uh, for scholarly uh, publishing. Uh, the reason why we have taken the route we have is uh, because we engaged with the, the publishers. Uh, Robert Yan, actually, I think in his days as director general, uh, engaged with the publishers and they told them, they told him that in order for them to provide open access options for all of their outputs, uh, they needed funder mandates. And they evidenced the progress that had been made through the Gates mandate in the States to say funder mandates move you forward. 
So Coalition S is primarily a coalition of funders because we think funder mandates will move things forward. There are funder mandates across much of Europe and other parts of the world, including the states already. Of course, so the principle of funder mandates is straightforward. Uh, the details vary. And uh, so the first aim of Coalition S is full and immediate open access. The second aim is to provide a framework for getting there, which we did first with a set of 10 principles. And we've now provided some guidance and implementation. Uh, this is part of the consultation, the feedback on the guidance on implementation. And of course, we expect that we will amend the guidance on the basis, we will change the guidance on the basis of the feedback we get. So I'm delighted to have this chance to listen to your questions. I will provide answers as far as possible. What I'm not going to do is indicate where we will be once all of the feedback has come in, uh, because we don't know. It depends on what the feedback says. Uh, we're reading some very helpful and informed commentary, uh, and we need to review where we are uh, having received that information. Uh, I would say that uh, just as the publishers told us they would provide uh, open access routes if there were funder mandates, uh, so we are talking with the publishers about uh, what routes they might offer, uh, particularly their concerns around details of the proposals, uh, which they see uh, provide difficult business models for them. Uh, of course, this is, uh, in the end, will be a commercial discussion between rectors' conferences and publishers. We are not the, the main economic actor in this, but we are setting up a framework so that cost-effective uh, possibilities are available. And we see uh, right now all over Europe discussions taking place. Of course, in Sweden, you're in a, a particular position where you are challenging hard uh, some of the publishers. Uh, Wiley have just done a deal in Germany. Uh, Wiley and Springer Nature are in discussion with our Rector's Conference, uh, just collections it's called, in the UK. And in each case, uh, progress is being made towards full and immediate open access. Uh, exactly the nature of that progress uh, we will be reviewing. Uh, we uh, are aligning Plan S with other open access initiatives, such as OA 2020, and we're closely engaged with that. We're also closely engaged outside Europe with uh, the US, where uh, several of us have been to Washington, and also to California, where they're trying to uh, have an open access route to publication uh, from the University of California Digital Library. Uh, Robert Yan is, I think, in India next week. I'm in Japan this week. We are traveling all over the world to try, as far as is reasonably possible, create a guidance on implementations that works within different countries' systems. We're also talking to lots and lots of uh, Learn and Society publishers beyond uh, the commercial publishers uh, and indeed commissioning work to identify ways forward uh, with them. And we're talking to lots of researchers like today. Stan in the Netherlands has had open meetings already and I think has one more uh, to come. Uh, we're engaging as broadly as we can to get the best possible feedback to identify real problems, but also to identify worries people have which uh, may be dealt with uh, by modifications to the guidelines or indeed uh, the publishers offering new routes. Now, I think I'm going to pause there because uh, I could talk for quite a long time about it. But uh, the, general, uh, ten the general aim is full and immediate open access in a timely fashion, uh, bringing together uh, the publishers, uh, researchers and funders. Thanks very much. Thank you so much, uh, David. So, uh, now we will have a microphone uh, and I would like to ask you to state your name, title and faculty you belong to uh, and then ask your questions to uh, Mr. Sweeney. Yeah, the first question is always the most difficult, so come along, don't be shy. Uh, hi, uh, I'm Jan Nettergaard from uh, the... Um, uh, science faculty. Uh, one issue that we have been discussing has been the issue of our society journals. 
uh, what you were talking about until now has been mainly, uh, let's call it the commercial journals. But society journals are, of course, also selling uh, their journals, and they do it for a kind of profit, however, a profit that goes for the, to the, uh, back to the researchers in general, at least in infrastructure and so on. Uh, I have understood that these kind that uh, the system that exists in several of these journals at the moment, which is that you can buy open access, uh, will no, according to this, uh, will no longer be allowed. That uh, because I th will definitely prefer a system where the society journals are also surviving, as I think they are the often among the best in their scientific criticism, etc., uh, and uh, to join that with open access, I think, is fully okay. But you are talking all the time about the uh, commercial companies. How? What is your view on uh, the society journals? Well, it is essential that society journals uh, can uh, thrive, can move forward in the open access world. It is essential. So let's start from that point. However, the uh, society journals function in many different ways. Uh, uh, quite a large group of societies publish their journals under, uh, the, with the support of the commercial publishers, and they are available as part of the bundled deals that um, uh, the publishers do with uh, the rector's conferences. So the starting point is uh, one part of the society journal is no different to the commercial publisher. And of course, if you are doing so-called big deals, uh, where you're dealing with a lot of aggregated material, a lot of material put together, it's, it's just bureaucratically easier to do the deal than when dealing with hundreds of small societies. We are, though, also talking to small societies. Uh, we have identified issues around uh, administration and payment, where they are keen that we should work to provide a framework that cuts their administrative load. Uh, so we're looking at a payment gateway with one group of open access publishers. Uh, we're looking actually with a different group of open access publishers at uh, mechanisms uh, by which, they, well, framework deals so that uh, they don't have to do individual uh, transformative deals with uh, retros conferences or indeed with, uh, with universities. Uh, now, all of this is com complicated. All I can really say at the moment is my starting point, we recognize the importance of society publishers, uh, that they are, are publishers of all kinds. Many, uh, I take the British Medical Journal as an example, which are already freely available open access, although uh, there's also a subscription uh, being paid. So there are routes to success for those uh, scholarly publishers, and we cannot possibly produce a final guidance that doesn't move to address the need to bring uh, as many as possible uh, of the scholarly publishers uh, into, uh, into compliance. It is clear, though, that we still do want full and immediate open access for uh, learned societies. Uh, I realize there are complexities with their business model, which uh, I've talked to them uh, about. Uh, but to say that open, open access just won't work for learned societies, I would find very strange indeed when uh, learned societies are basically our own people. Question? Thank you. And next question up here on the front, we have one, two, three. Yes. You should start there with the lady. Okay. Yeah. Um, hi, I would like to have some more clear. Okay, sorry. I'm Karina Mood, uh, Stockholm University Sophie Institute for Social Research. I'm a professor there. So I, I would like to have some more clear information about what this plan S actually will mean for us because I find there's a lot of uh, disinforma disinformation or perhaps confusion out there. So Drutting in last week at the hearing uh, here in Stockholm said that uh, on a question said that well, there, are, there is no limitation on where you can publish. You can publish in Nature if you want. Uh, and then we checked and we said, but Nature has an embargo on six months. So how should we then do that? I mean, we cannot use green archiving because they require an embargo of six months. Uh, should we then pay the hybrid 
ourselves with our own money and then publish it in an archive with a CC BY. So I, I would like some clarity for, from you what this actually will mean for us researchers. And, and also in terms of, of I, I mean, I, I don't really like that you use the term open access. This is what you are promoting here is not a, a wide version of open access, but a very specific version, uh, pay to publish. And that raises a paywall on the other side for publishing. And I would like to know what you think. I mean, it's OK for those who have funding from the funders. They promise to, to help you with that. But what about the other people? In case you succeed in flipping this system, what, a, what about those who do not have funding? How will you be sure that they can publish? So, so some answers to those questions. I have more questions, but I can end there. Well, there's, a, there's at least three questions there, all of which are interesting. Uh, let me take the first, the first point. Uh, we are not insisting on pay to publish as the model. Uh, we are very happy with embargo free uh, CC by deposit. There are many open access journals already where there are subscriptions, but where they deposit, and the British Medical Journal is one, but there are many other Royal Society journals uh, where uh, they allow embargo free deposit. So it's just not true to say that we're insisting on one model. In the end, the publishers have got to offer models, and some of them do not believe that the subscription model will work in the open access world. I understand that, but open access has been the aim for more than 20 years. They've had time to work it out. Uh, we do need to work harder and with some pressure to uh, find appropriate models. You ask for clarity about uh, what will happen. Well, that does depend on what the publishers offer. Uh, Springer Nature are in discussion with uh, my rector's conference. Uh, it is not public yet what they have offered, but I can assure you it will be different to what was offered before. So to assume that you can't publish anywhere because it's not possible now, uh, you've got to wait and see what is possible as, we, as the rector's conferences move forward in their discussions with the publishers, who, of course, want your material. Uh, you act as if it's a tremendous privilege for you to publish in those journals. But actually, those journals only survive uh, because they have your material to publish. This is a balanced relationship, and, uh, we, uh, we're, and we've, got to, um, we've got to work out ways to publish, which as far as possible do not involve any uh, constraints uh, uh, and allow us to uh, publish in journals that have strong peer review systems. Just though, on your last and perhaps most difficult question, uh, when you do research, you have no right to impose costs on anyone. So if you want to use a very expensive piece of equipment, uh, somehow or other, somebody has got to fund it and you've got to make a case. Similarly, if you want to go to uh, some expensive conferences, you've got to get in some way get a grant, which may be from your institution internally, or uh, you may have acquired uh, uh, grant funding that allows for that. But you can't just demand it. Uh, in principle, you can't expect to demand to, pre uh, to uh, publish your output at a, a very high cost imposed on someone else. Uh, I hope that principle is not challenged because I hope we find affordable routes to publish for everyone. And we've already proposed a model that would allow those in the global south who already struggle with subscriptions but have waivers from publishers to have a similar waiver system uh, for APCs. There are also, of course, many routes to relatively cheap publishing, and often actually through learned uh, societies. Uh, but they may not be the route that the academic wants to choose. And at some point, there's got to be a balance between the academic, the researcher's desire to incur a, la a large cost and the willingness of someone to pay that. I realize in the subscription world it's different because you offload your cost on readers. But we don't think it's right that you should have to read, uh, uh, to, um, you should have to uh, pay to read uh, publications, particularly where they come from public funding. I think uh, this policy cannot be enforced on those uh, who are funding themselves. That's, that's fine. And, uh, but it's up to the industry to provide routes as much as us. Uh, the balance is free and immediate, and we've got to work out routes that as far as possible address everybody's uh, concerns. And I predict we will do that, uh, 
but I think it will just take a little bit of time to get there. Do we want a replic on that? Yeah, yes, yeah. replica. I, I am uh, a bit concerned about that response because you say you don't really know what will happen. And the fact is that the funders behind Coalition S or the funders in Coalition S, they uh, stand at 3 to 4% of the world's research. And uh, even getting some of the other ones you're talking to, you won't be a large fraction of the, of the world's research. So what you're doing, you're gambling on flipping this system uh, with us, we, us taking the risk. And we will actually become like uh, a substandard team in, in the international research community because we are only 3 to 4% and we will have to publish in, in these channels that exist for open access. And you say that, well, it may change, but we don't know whether they will change. The publications may not at all change because they still have the other 97 or 96% to, to rely upon. So you are actually risking us. You are not paying the price. We are, and we are really, really concerned about this. And we don't want to be thrown out in a very insecure landscape. So that's, I, I think it's quite arrogant, actually, of Coalition S, to throw us no, out no, I, into something that let, doesn't let, yet exist. Let, let's, let's not go for that kind of, of language. Uh, of course, we need to achieve some degree of critical mass for this to work. And the idea that in the end we would impose something where we don't have uh, widespread support, uh, I think is just looking on the gloomy side. Of course we won't impose it. Of course we're not arrogant. We're traveling the world to build support for our coalition. Uh, now, I absolutely agree that we have to bring these people on board, and part of the feedback is to establish guidance that does bring them on board. But if you take into account that the Californians, 10% of scholarly publishing in the U.S. is from the University of California, and they have a straight policy of doing transformative arrangements. The Chinese have made some very, very positive statements, and I know, because I've talked to them personally, it's their intention to deliver. They do have to do so. Uh, we are in India uh, this week, and uh, we're talking to a load of other funders around the world. I would say that in terms of general support for... Uh, full and immediate open access, general support for Plan S, at the moment we're getting between up to between 40 and 50% of the community. Of course, all of that has to be delivered, but we cannot, I, in, there is no way we can magically commit all these people to sign up to, full and to a plan to full and immediate open access without the kind of consultative session that we're going through now and without the traveling around the world to talk to Japan and China and India uh, and so on. The chances of European funders being the outliers in this are, it, it, that's just not part of our thinking. We will assemble a coalition. Alternatively, uh, we will fail in this attempt at uh, full and immediate open access as we failed for the last 20 years. To say that we shouldn't do it because we haven't yet assembled a sufficient uh, coalition, is defeatist. We await the support, and time after time, people are saying, we support Plan S. Uh, then they say, but we have these worries around it. Well, the answer to that is not to say we'll go away and we won't do it. It is to say, how can we address those worries? How can we find compromise? Uh, hold on, please. Please, we need your mic because we're recording this. But we had a, another speaker here, so please wait on next to the lady here. Yeah. Yeah. I'm next to the lady. Next yeah. Sorry, just a little follow up on what Canada's question here. Uh, uh, my name is Gustav Lenius. Uh, I'm the director of the Institute for Future Studies in Stockholm and also a professor of practical philosophy at Stockholm University. Uh, you were talking towards the end of your answer about uh, you can't publish or you impose cost on other people. You think that that's something that shouldn't be allowed. Now, that's a rather radical principle if you compare it to another principle that we share very much in Sweden, but I think you would share it also in Great Britain, and it's this idea of academic freedom. We say that you have the right to freely publish your results wherever you so decide. And it seems that your principles no, it's not such a right. You can't publish it for in any place where people have to pay to access it. Have I understood that correctly? Uh, well, 
First of all, I, I hope we will not get to that because I hope we will get to the point where the publishers offer Plan S compliant routes for everyone. But I, I'm afraid in the UK, academic freedom is the right to say things freely without, uh, without threat or punishment. It's not the right to say them in the location that you want to say them. I, I realize that... Uh, some people think the U.S. statement, the uh, American University professors in 1940, does say that. Others don't. Uh, but I don't think academic freedom includes the right to deprive readers of the freedom to read your material because it is behind a paywall. There's a balance here between the responsibility that comes with general academic freedom uh, and the freedom to uh, inflict damage on others. I think academic freedom is the right to say what you want, but I don't think that choosing the particular route you want to do it, you can't require, you don't have the freedom to publish in nature just because you want to. Nature has got to accept uh, your material. So, no, I don't accept in principle the academic freedom uh, point uh, because I think it's a very narrow definition. Uh, there's books being written about this as well. And assertion of a freedom by a group of people that gives them a privilege without looking at the responsibility is, in my view, wrong. Now, there's a, there's a guy who's published extensively on, on this uh, philosopher, and we've had constructive discussions. I think, uh, I'm not sure we've entirely agreed, but in the end, I hope that this is not a problem because uh, I expect the publishers to offer compliant routes for uh, all of the material. I expect there'll be a way to publish in the places you want to publish, and I think there's a responsibility on us as funders in bringing this forward uh, to work with the publishers and the learned societies to make that happen. Thank you. Now we have uh, the man beside them. Yes, please, go ahead. No, so then I see there is a difference between the Swedish tradition. We actually have this in, uh, even in our legislation, so there might be a legal problem. And actually we are obliged also to publish our results in the uh, uh, subscription journal, namely when we reach out to the general public. But I guess that at least should not be stopped by Plan S. We have to publish to reach out to the inner public and that would be subscri subscription journals. Well, why does it have to be in subscription journals, by the way? Well, when it comes to this, to reaching out to the general audience, we have to publish in the newspapers and things like that. And uh, that's yeah, but that's not scholarly. We're only talking about the uh, production of primary scholarly outputs. Uh, we're not talking about... Uh, uh, journalism, we're not talking about commentary, uh, absolutely no problems with uh, that. I myself write articles for um, uh, the, the press, but they are not scholarly, the outcomes of funded scholarly research are not the primary outcomes. Of, well, here uh, it is uh, one of the primary outcomes, but I hope that this will at least be a, an exception, especially in humanities, a lot of uh, things are published in uh, monographs that you, know, you have to buy. They're not going to be free. Well, no, no, yes. absolutely. So that's, that's no, no. Secondly, but I want to insist on the fact that the, the way we have uh, when it comes to academic freedom here doesn't, uh, we should be able to freely publish wherever we want. I, to be honest, I, others from Sweden have not said that to me, uh, but uh, there's no way that Plan S can break the law, so you don't need to worry. You know, we just cannot break the law. It's as simple as that. I think monographs are not in scope of the current proposals. Uh, uh, as it happens, I'm very involved with monograph publishing in the UK. Uh, I accept that there are qualitative differences between uh, uh, monograph publishing and journal publishing, uh, and uh, we've got quite a long way to go. I, basically, monographs are, mon some of them anyway, are monetizable in their own right, and by custom and practice, that's, uh, that's the way that scholarly research is, is uh, moved forward. Uh, journal articles are not monetizable in their own right, uh, so it's a, different, it's a different game. Thank you. Now we have on the first row. Hi, Eric Lindahl, Professor of Biochemistry and Biophysics, so science or even life sciences. Uh, I have two questions for you. Uh, one of them, I very much agree with your general comments and everything and hoping that this will plan out for the best. But I think it was only three years ago that we were all certain that the UK would not leave the European Union and that didn't quite work out. Uh, so maybe we should take some headroom that things might not work out the way we hope. Uh, 
And then on the other end, I see that's also a poker game. If you show the cards, you not, don't have a whole lot of negotiation room. But could you comment on what is the need for the extreme accelerated pace that you're basically asking a bunch of funders who sign on to 11 months from now enforce something where we don't really know what it is that they're going to enforce? And the second part I would like to comment on, in general, uh, page charges, of course, something that can work, but we've also seen the last two decades a rather dramatic increase of the page charges um, so that the publishers keep getting their profits from page charges instead. And while I could certainly imagine, say, nature, it might be fine to charge $4,000 if there's a lot of editing, but right now we're seeing pretty much any journal, they try to go for $3,000 or $4,000, and for the vast majority of them, I think they're overcharging. So over open access with absurd page charges isn't really for society at large, it's not really a whole lot more open. Well, first of all, I appreciate your comments about poker games, and I agree with your uh, analysis of uh, the position. Uh, I think um, the situation with page charges, I didn't say in my opening remarks, we 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 started off with a bold statement, that essentially we should cap, cap uh, page charges or APCs, or however you want to describe them. Uh, in fact, that was a very bold statement. What we're saying at this stage is that we need to have a way of evaluating the fair and reasonable uh, costs and therefore prices associated with scholarly publishing. And we're therefore focusing at the moment on transparency about costs uh, because we think the price should be based on cost and not based on uh, whatever the market will bear, as Springer Nature said in their public offering a document, or to put it another way, reputation. Whatever people are prepared to pay, we'll charge, was the Springer Nature line. And we think we should pay a fair margin, uh, and that margin uh, uh, on what is a reasonable cost. Now, as you say, uh, the costs of publishing in some journals are much higher than others. It's perfectly reasonable that the uh, the charge should be therefore higher. So I think let's let's move to transparency. Let's also uh, in uh, we again without me referring to it, we have a whole plan uh, for trying to eliminate predatory journals by uh, having a list of uh, journals where we think the peer review system is satisfactory. So there's gains in dealing, uh, in moving to this open access as well as loss. But let me just finish on your last point. In the end, Plan S is not the economic actor. Uh, the, the funders are not the final economic actor. We can say how much we, pay, we will pay towards it. Uh, we can have mandates for where you publish. But uh, in the whole world of publishing, uh, the economic actor is generally the university or the university consortia. And the only way, as you see in Sweden, the only way to contain costs is to refuse to do deals with the publishers. And that will bring some pain because you either can't publish or can't read. Uh, and that, again, going back to the academic freedom uh, point, if a journal offers a price, a page charge, which is outrageously high, I think it's reasonable for the university or the collection of universities to say, we just can't go there. And it's unreasonable for academics to say, well, you've got to pay no matter how much it costs. Now, you're in that situation, I think, in Sweden at the moment. Uh, we, we see it most visibly in Germany, where uh, uh, access to Elsevier journals has been cut off. And that's because the Rector's Conference think that the prices being asked are just too high. Uh, we're in the same position in California, although it's not been cut off yet. Now, that's nothing to do with Plan S or Coalition S. That's an economic judgment of the people doing the deal. We will provide a framework, which we hope will provide some transparency and help. Uh, we may, as funders, refuse to pay more than a certain amount. Uh, that's, I think, a reasonable position of all, all funders. But that's, in the end, the key decision is for the people who do your big deals uh, and uh, some, at some point, the only way to control costs is to refuse to buy. So, do we have some more questions in the back? Maybe there's been a, just to see that. Otherwise, let's go ahead. We have one on the front row here. 
Thank you very much. I'm John Johnson, Professor of Sociology at the Swedish Institute for Social Research here at Stockholm University. Uh, so the whole planning of uh, Plan S uh, was made by EU bureaucrats, and then it has been taken over by research councils. And at no point in that process uh, were researchers actually asked to contribute, and there was no discussion about it. In fact, the first time when researchers come in is now during the implementation phase. And uh, that's, uh, of course, very worrying because you think that Plan S has something to hide. But as soon as Plan S was actually published, the Ten Commandments were published, uh, a lot of researchers did protest, actually. And, I mean, I think it's telling that once this has been public now, uh, the Royal Swedish Academy of Science has gone against it, says that we don't want Plan S. British Academy has gone against it. A lot of other learned societies have ex expressed worries about it. Uh, last week, UCL researchers uh, complained about it. And uh, this whole thing that, that this is a planned thing without any analysis of the consequences for researchers, isn't that a worry for you? Well, I think virtually every group you just mentioned said, we support open access. We don't like some elements of Plan S. And uh, in terms of UCL, we were at the meeting. Uh, I think there was also quite a lot of support at the meeting, but the, the, the meeting report clearly uh, has uh, concerns. I, this is the period where we're consulting the researchers. I mean, from the, on the 4th of September, we announced a set of principles to work with. Uh, somebody's got to set up something for people to discuss. We did that. Uh, on the 27th of November, to uh, barely uh, 10 weeks later, uh, we produced a guide, set of guidelines on implementation that were informed by the many comments that had been made. Uh, having ma set out the guidelines, we're now receiving lots more input. Uh, some of it actually hasn't taken account of the changes that were made from the principles to the guidance, but um, uh, some of it does. Uh, Martin Eve, who's a keen uh, uh, study uh, student of the system in the UK, has produced uh, 17 points of criticism, which I really sort of align with the, the UCL comments. Uh, I think we have a ways, ways to address most of those, and we will do so. This is the discussion period. Nobody's having a gun held to their head now. And in terms of timescales, we want the policies to be in place by the end of this year. That's not an impossible position. The implementation period will last three or four years after that. And we've, again, people act as if they haven't read that in the guidance. Some, uh, it's open to funders whether they, for example, only apply the, uh, the rules to uh, grants where the calls happen post 1120. Now, if you're calling for a grant on 1120, you're not going to be publishing material from that for two years, at least possibly longer. Uh, we also, of course, have to respect the deals that are being done now, that Wiley deal in Germany, for example. Uh, we can't uh, overturn contracts already in place. So we're actually looking at roughly a five-year transition to the new environment. Uh, we've adapted to some of the comments so that hybrid journals uh, work under transformative agreements. Uh, green publishing works, but we are asking for zero embargo, which has always been the aim. And I think, uh, and we're working with OA2020 to, uh, to look at the differences between uh, their view, which actually comes without real pressure to move to open access, and ours, which does. So I think if you're in the camp where you believe in open access, the answer is work with us, because this is the thing that's got momentum to make the publishers offer new deals. If we do nothing... If we just keep criticizing, the publishers will continue to offer expensive deals that do not further open access. This is the chance you've got to move things forward. Criticizing people for being EU bureaucrats. I'm a, I'm a Brit. Uh, we don't think much generally. You know, We have our own view of EU bureaucrats. I think that is a most unhelpful thing to say. What matters is the principles. Uh, introducing the people, criticizing the people for who they are, who did it is just not right. You're shooting the messenger. Let's look at the message. You're not 
playing the ball, you're playing the man, as we would say at football. Let's not look at personalizing this. Let's look at the principles. And I think many of you have made fair and reasonable points that we do need to address. I accept that. Yes, a question on the... Uh, we will move ahead. Uh, yeah, a question on the second row. We have five more minutes uh, with you, David. You're still on. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah. Barbara Cannon, science faculty, professor of physiology. Uh, I want initially to say that I very strongly support the people sitting in front of me here so that you know my point of view here. Uh, my second point is that in connection with what was said earlier about us being some sort of objects where, that are being played with to test the system, what I'm, one of my concerns with Plan S is that we are going to be making our doctoral students and postdoctoral fellows in a weaker position in a competitive system and that this will not be possible to take into account if they want to go to prestigious places in the United States, for example, they need publications in well-known uh, and very well-respected journals, and they're not going to get them if they go into these current open access journals. Well, can I, can I say, first of all, I think that's an unfair comment about current open access journals, many of which have a good reputation, strong peer review system. However, leave that aside. Uh, you. So, so hold on, how about eLife and the Public Library of Science? These are poor journals, are they? We can't hear your comments, so let uh, Mr. Sweeney answer. But you're assuming that the publishers won't offer open access options for their journals. The Wiley Deal in uh, Germany offers open access options for all of their journals. The uh, deals that we're doing with Springer Nature and Wiley in the UK will lead to 100% publication open access in uh, Wiley journals. Now, I absolutely accept we've got a long way to go to win the publishers over, but we are talking very constructively to uh, most of the big publishers, and they are very keen to offer open access options. I think uh, we are also talking to the... Uh, the agencies in the States, uh, how do the University of California think since they are going this route? Do they think their postdoctoral students won't be able to get jobs with the National Institutes of Health and so on? I think that is over-dramatizing the situation. I think we do have to see what comes out. And I think it is of necessity that Plan S carries uh, sufficient publishers and learning societies with it that the routes to publish you want are available. If we don't do it, I, it will not work. But everything that I see from my engagements with those people is that it's in the interests of the publishers to capture the work of your good postdoc students and so on and get it published. I think you're making assumptions. It's not going to work, you say. I think you have to wait and see what deals are on the table and you've got to trust your funders that they won't impose mandates that disadvantage your um, your academics. Why would they? Uh, it's in the interest of the funders uh, to work together to provide routes to open access that allow publication in strong peer review systems uh, for all of their um, funded researchers. One last question, comments? Yes, reply here. So there are many ways of being positive to open access without embracing Plan S. So, uh, for example, California, you talk a lot about California, they're, they're low embargoes. So uh, I think that this is one of the very hard stances of Plan S that you should reconsider, but not allowing no embargo whatsoever. So uh, many, uh, many open access uh, advocates really promote solutions where you can still have embargoes. So that is something I should, you sh think you should be more soft about. Uh, and um, also about the, the hybrid publishing is also a way to open access. So if the goal is just open access, you can be positive in many ways. You don't need to be positive to Plan S because you're positive to open access. I think this is a very important distinction. Uh, I don't think that latter point is that important a distinction, but we're very happy to talk about it. We're, uh, you don't have to deposit to Plan S 
you have to deposit in a repository that meets a certain set of standards. And that's no different to the aspiration we have for our uh, green open access today. Uh, we might have set the requirements for uh, repositories uh, a bit more aspirational than can be realistically delivered. That's the kind of feedback we're getting and we'll listen to it. But I, I think our, syst our system is very sympathetic to green. Can I just say the California deal is not green. It is absolutely not green. Uh, the California are going for a transformative arrangement uh, with Elsevier that is uh, pay to publish. However, uh, if the only gap between us is the embargo period, then at least that narrows it down to something very clear. I think we've seen actually over the last uh, five years in the UK, embargo periods lengthen from publishers. That can't be right. Partial open access, delayed open access is not our aim. Uh, but I absolutely get the point that we've got to provide uh, uh, green open access routes. But the thing that worries me is lots of our publishers, the Royal Society, the BMJ, do this already. And yet people tell me it's not possible. It clearly is possible. But the uh, publishers are playing a game of poker as well. Uh, and I think we've got to recognize that uh, it's to an extent we've got to stand together and we've got to demand open access from the publishers, because that's what we want, and we've got to ask them to come forward with routes to do so. I, as somebody pointed out, I think, at the Open Access 2020 in Berlin, if you just were able, if it was technically feasible, to flip the whole system overnight, the same amount of money going in, the material could be available open access. Now, bureaucratically, that's not possible. So we've got to have a path towards full open access, and that path is showing us a whole load of obstacles. But I think if you believe in full open access, then Plan S is the only way to go, and you want to help us get it right. You want to help us modify things. You don't want to accuse us of evil things. You want to help us be informed by the way you see the world and what are the critical obstacles. I haven't heard anybody really say they don't believe in open access. I would say that we believe in immediate open access, and that is, that is a challenge. Uh, but there's not that big a gap between us and many people who support open access, and many of the gaps are different for different people. So if we're going to get there, we've all got to compromise and move forward. I want you to work with us to make full and immediate open access happen. I want to use your knowledge and skills, but also your support and determination uh, so that we're not just being the tools of an industry that wants to give us the offerings they want. We want the offering as customers, readers, and authors that we want. Thank you very much, uh, David Sweeney. Uh, a big hand of applause. <laughs> Thank you. We don't want to lose you now. Uh, we will continue and get the, the rector's perspective. So welcome Astrid Söderberg again. Thank you. Uh, I want to share with you an experience from last week. Last Friday I was in Brussels at a council meeting for the European University Association and that is the heads of all the national rector's conferences. Uh, and there the president of Science Europe, Mark Schiltz, made a presentation on the same topic. Uh, the implementation of Plan S with several of the same main points, of course, as David Sweeney has now shared with us. Uh, and Mark Schiltz was followed by a representative for the European University Association Expert Group on Open Science. Uh, and they were uh, very positive in principle uh, because they thought that from the rector's perspective and not least from all us who are negotiating with the publishers, uh, we believe that uh, this is a way to move things forward, but still we have to do so uh, in a, a thoughtful way. So the EUA expert group expressed three concerns, which have also echoed in your comments here. Uh, one is that research councils in small countries may be waiting for a larger critical mass of large research councils adopting Plan S. Uh, then, secondly, that the consequences of Plan S on international collaborative research publications, uh, because researchers may 
face contradictory policies with, for example, countries not embedding Plan S in their policies. And thirdly, uh, some more technical points, for example, concerns on standards for interoperability of repositories. I think that it has been clear from the debate during these last 45 minutes that Plan S is indeed a matter of principle. And what is important with its aim is that it aims to flip the system. And this would, in the long run, be only in favor of the researchers. I think it's, uh, it has been a bit overemphasized that this plan is so bold and so radical, etc. In fact, it is a quite pragmatic general framework where you will still be able to develop different national paths or even personal paths. And I think that it is very important to, to uh, also to acknowledge that we are now in this process of discussing, negotiating, uh, where we can decide with what to fill this general framework if we uh, go for Plan S. Uh, and here, of course, the much larger question of research assessment is at stake. And it is clear, and it is also... Uh, very understandable uh, that young researchers are much more worried than their more established colleagues. Uh, but the ultimate goal is, of course, to break up the current system, the subscription model. And I myself uh, believe, after a few years as chair of the Bibsum Consortium, uh, that it is indeed necessary because, in many ways, the current system has reached a kind of end point. The publishers cannot go on forever to just accelerate their profit, the profit gained from the work done for free by researchers, writing articles, peer reviewing them, editing journals, etc. Uh, and also, I believe that the quantitative approach to scholarly publishing risks to undermine more daring projects, and it also threatens the peer review system as such uh, if this system is reduced to merely mechanical review. Personally, I believe that the system would benefit from open review processes, that is to adhere once again to the seminar culture that founded academia as we know it. But most of all, why I think it is important to, to uh, have this discussion about Plan S is that it offers a unique momentum which was very clear uh, at the Berlin seminar earlier referred to where things actually have started to move globally. But as with all paradigm shifts, uh, of which the transition to open access is indeed a major example, they are never easy. So hence the need for further discussion and dialogue. Uh, but I'm very, I'm very much looking forward now to have also the researcher's perspective. Uh, so back to Anna. Who will then welcome Erik Lindahl? And you've already presented yourself, but you will get a microphone so you can talk. Thank you. Uh, I will try to keep this reasonably brief too, so we have a chance to discuss, because there's actually lots of great opinions before. So I'm a professor of biophysics uh, over at the science faculty, although I mostly sit out for, at SciLife Lab. And science is similar to many of your areas in that we've, uh, we publish a lot, and we no matter what we say about San Francisco Declaration of Research Assessment and everything, it still matters where we publish. Um, I might have a different view. I might like to push a different point in Wetenskap's audit. But at the end of the day, you see it on your colleagues, the paper reviewers that they talk about, the papers that get Twittered about. So even though I might like reality work differently as a researcher, I think it is also important that we accept reality for what it is. Then we might try to change it, but we can't pretend that we have a different reality. The challenge for me, though, is that I also very much believe in open access. Um, I happen to have had a, a career in science where we have benefited precisely because of the things we did, we did in an open fashion from the start. And, and I, just like Astrid, I'm deeply troubled by the way that the publishing industry works. Um, you can certainly, there are certainly lots of publishers, including purely commercial ones, that do great efforts and services to the community. But long term, we can't afford the system where the, uh, the costs go up double digits per year, right? Because at some point in the future, we won't be able to afford to hire new professors. And I kind of prefer to have professors instead of journals. The problem, though, that I see with Plan S uh, is that we are all 
it's exceptionally accelerated and as much I kind of like it this momentum behind it uh, full disclosure but here too I like it because I expect that the journals will adapt and we're not really going to end up where plan S threatens that we will end up but that is a remarkably dangerous assumption and uh, we could of course end up in a place that doesn't make us quite as happy um, and of course I will survive uh, the worst thing that can happen to me is that I'm there might be a journal that I, a paper I would like to publish, and I, I get it rejected for, say, eLife and uh, Plus Biology, and then I might have to publish in some significantly lower impact venue. In absolutely worst case, I will lose a grant, and that means that I'm safe. Although I might have to hire, fire my senior researcher, but I'm good. The problem, though, is for a junior professor, say, assistant professor working in the science faculty here, trying to get their career. They're fighting day and night to get through this, and. When they don't get that paper, they don't get tenure, and then we fire them. So it's easy, it's a bit easier for me, sad as it is, to lose that researcher. I am not the one that would actually lose this. And that does make me not sleepless, but it troubles me a bit more. The other challenge I see is that at still point, we need to get something done uh, with uh, relation to the, the cost here. And I actually, so Gustav and I have talked about this on uh, Facebook and everything. I don't necessarily, I don't agree with that this is limiting freedom of speech or anything. Uh, we, of course, have the right to publish anything we want where we want. We don't necessarily have the right to get paid to do it or have the right to have somebody else fund it. Uh, in worst case, I can whip out my credit card and pay it for my personal account. That would hurt, but I have the right to do it. Um, so... I don't necessarily think it's productive to go in the way saying that it's limiting our academic freedom. I not, might not like the consequences, but I don't think that Plan S is fundamentally a limitation of any rights we have. Um, then I might, I might think that David and some others are a bit too enthusiastic about how quickly it will solve all the problems. And the final part that worries me, what happens if we end up in a situation where we start enforcing this in Europe, but they don't in the US, they don't do it in Asia, they don't do it in Japan, and they don't do it in China. Suddenly, by the time we want to recruit that new, have the new open call, and when we're interviewing the junior professors, will they come to Stockholm University? Because they're going to need to spend their five years competing with everyone else in the world, and if they're going to need to start out by being handicapped if they go to Stockholm University, that's certainly going to be one more thing they consider before coming here. But in the interest of time, I think I will stop there and uh, take any questions. We will take questions okay. after Wilhelm Wiedmark as well. So yeah, thank we, you so we much. Yeah, we will have a longer uh, time for questions. So now Wilhelm Wiedmark, Director of Stockholm University Library. Please tell us how yes. to... Yes. So what is happening at Stockholm University with the financing of open access? Plan S. In the implementation plan, they started to talk about the transformative agreements. And Coalition S acknowledged existing transformative agreements. And then they say we can negotiate new transformative agreements. And that was new in the implementation plan. And the transformative deal is then it's a both read and publish rights. Where we earlier have paid only for reading, we include publishing. And the price is often based on both what we paid for the reading and then the APC costs that have been paid at the university or in Sweden. Through those licenses, we get control of the cost of both reading and publishing. Today, we don't have control. We pay for reading at one side and publishing at the other side, and the cost rises on both sides. And with all these agreements, it is less administrations for the researchers. So you don't have to pay, you don't have to have the administrations. We see that you are a researcher from Stockholm University and you get accepted to publish in those journals. So the university will cover costs that earlier was financed by the funders during these agreements. So what kind of transformative agreements have we got today, we have with Springer Compact a new agreement for three years. 
We have with Institute of Physics, De Gruyter, Royal Society of Chemistry, Taylor and Francis, Cambridge University Press, Oxford University Press is under negotiations, but I think we will finish in a couple of months. American Institute of Physics, Wiley is also under negotiation and will finish in February, I think. We have Spring Nature Folly OIA offered to all the universities in Sweden. So this is not a transformative agreement, but it is an agreement where the university will pay for the APCs. Elsevier is a big problem. As you know, we don't have an agreement with Elsevier right now. And we are talking to Elsevier, but they won't accept to give us an agreement and read and publish agreement. We are trying to get some sort of discussion again to move Elsevier to give us a read and publish agreement. And I think Plan S is really good to have in the discussion with Elsevier to try to move Elsevier so we can get an agreement with Elsevier as well. Here at Stockholm University, we have looked at the figures where are our researchers publishing, at which pure open access journals are you publishing in. And we found out that the four top ones, we thought it was better to have a direct license with them for Stockholm University, so the researchers don't have to pay and don't have to have the administration. So today we have agreements with Biomed Central, Copernicus, Frontiers, MDPI, PLOS. All those are the journals where the Stockholm University researchers are most publishing in. Then we have the Elsevier money. As we don't have a license with Elsevier, we thought that the money should go back to the researchers. So the library will finance all APCs with pure open access journals. So if you have, you know that you will publish in an open access journal that is pure, not in a hybrid, that in a pure open access journals, you just send an email to the library and we check that you are an authorized author at Stockholm University and we will take the cost for those uh, APCs, and that could be with Elsevier's Pure Journals or Weil or any publishers. So here we have looked on what the cost of APCs are at Stockholm University 2018, and it's about 10 million. That is outside of the licensing agreement for reading, and that we paid 10 million today. And today, the we centralized finance for about 60%. Then we have from different founders that are published. So Wetenskapsråd, that is the largest. But 10% is paid by the faculties as well. So 70% is paid from Stockholm Un University for the open access articles today. And as you can see, a rather big chunk here is in pure open access journals. And the blue ones are the articles in hybrid journals. And the hope with Plan S is that it should be only pure open access journals. But still, under the transformative agreements that we have, you can still publish in the hybrid journals for at least four or five years more. We have also looked at where we finance centrally, where do the researchers have their grants for, from. So for instance, 25% is from Wetenskapsrådet. So today, if you have your fund from Wetenskapsrådet, we take over the cost and you can keep your money within your project. You don't have to pay the publication as long as you publish within a transformative uh, agreement or in a pure open access journal. 
So if you have questions about open access and financing, you just can contact the university library at openaccesssu.se. So, thank you very much. Now we will have all the speakers joining me on stage um, and you will get some microphones or you will share it between you, depending on who asks. Perfectly fine. Yes. So, first question here. And what, do you want me to repeat this question now? I, I think I can speak loudly. Yeah, but the thing is that we're recording. <laughs> no, but I think we'll, we do like this. I can walk around a bit. Yes. Yeah. And then I go back and it's forward. Okay. That's nice. Yeah. So, thank you, Karina, again. Uh, I don't need to, to tell you my name. You've heard me such a lot. So, Wilhelm, uh, you refer a lot to Plan S now in your presentation. Uh, and, and I'm just wondering, uh, are you, uh, and, and maybe this is also a question for Astrid, so how, will, will Plan S at all affect Stockholm University policy about open access? I mean, you're not a signatory and you couldn't be since you're not a funder. So, and I'm also wondering, you talk about these transformative deals, but it's very important to remember that these are not Plan S compliant, because the Plan S compliant transformative deals have to end with those journals being fully open access at the end. So actually the Wiley deal in Germany that Sweeney talks such a lot about is actually not Plan S compliant, because those journals will not be open access at the end. There's nothing saying that. So two questions there then. Uh, the first one is, will Stockholm University change it po its policies to align with Plan S in any way? And the second, are those transformative deals meant to be Plan S compliant? Because I don't think they are. Well, i ask, answer your second question first. Yeah. I think that most of the deals that we call transformative deals will be accepted by, by Plan S. Even David Sweeney said that. Then, because they say that the deals we have, of course, the founders in Sweden that have signed Plan S will accept those deals. So I don't think there, that will be a problem. Then their principles are lost, because they say that they have to end with the journal being fully open. Seven years. Yes, but it's a transformation period during four years. So they will look how it will be compliant. I think when we are negotiating at the consortia, we have in now Springer Compact, we have some lines that Springer will say, what are our strategies for the future? So we negotiate with the publishers to tell us what, what are the strategies for the future. And that's, I think that plan S for us is really good when you are negotiating with the big publishers to do something. I think that is for us to, to respond. If it, well, what it means for you is that we have more transformative agreements where you don't have to pay. So that's I think is really good for the researchers at Stockholm University. I'm more thinking about mandates. Will Stockholm University tell us where to publish? Will Stockholm University tell us where to publish? Astrid? <laughs> no, we will not. Uh, and as I said. Uh, we are not signatories of Plan S as we are not financers. So, um, but can, I, can I just follow yes, up on that one? Because, of course, I, I'm, I would have been very surprised that you told them that you're going to tell them where to publish. But assuming that you now have a young professor in this area who doesn't have enough funds and they get their paper accepted in a very prestigious journal or monography or something, I should know more about your publication patterns, they can't fund it themselves. Would Stockholm University, would you encourage the dean or the head of the department to look into, can they use faculty funding to enable this important publication anyway? Or is the Stockholm University official position pretty much going to be deal with it? Because then we are, of course, indirectly pushing them where to publish, right? Uh, I think that... Stockholm University is not run from the top, it is not the rector who decides, so I think that our deans and vice rectors are, and heads of department are totally responsible and able to make their own decisions on uh, how to deal with such a question if it ever comes up. Yes. And I think at the library we will look at on how to find more money within the budget to pay for more APCs. So it, we will have more central funding for the APCs at Stockholm University.
Now we have some questions from the audience. Sorry, you're up next. Thank you. Um, again, if we go for the open access, why does the library not support or pay for open access in hybrid journals? I mean, we have the money free. You go for open access. Why are we then forced to either not take this money or, or actually publish in places we do not want to publish? Well, today I mentioned a lot of transformative agreements, with, which is hybrid journals. But outside of that, we think that we have to change the system. So we won't pay for hybrid journal outside of the transformative agreements, but we pay for open access at other publishers. But that's the situation right now. Thank you. And then off to you. Thank, thank you very much. So uh, I like um, the way that Plan S uh, uh, is extremely optimistic. And uh, I've seen that also Stockholm University now has, has joined these ranks of optimists there. But, I mean, the question is that there is a certain risk for researchers at Stockholm University if this is, doesn't pan out, right? And we know that the Plan S uh, has been at uh, American Research Council for a long time. They say no. The Switzerland Research Council now said no. Germany says no. Uh, Denmark Research Council has said no. The Swedish Research Council has said no. Loads of people who has had the chance, who have had the chance to comply to Plan S, and they say no. Right. So we are really risking here what what has been said that we are left behind. Right. And we can face difficulties in hiring people from the U.S we face difficulties in collaborating with people from the US when we can't publish anywhere. So isn't, isn't this to be too optimistic? Should you start and follow by Astrid? I, uh, yes, I agree. But on the other hand, I can also accept David's point that if we start out by saying that these are my principles, if you don't like them, I have others, the likelihood that you're going to get the publishers to change is zero, right? Uh, so I, I, I do accept that they need to play a tough game uh, and see what happens. Well, it, it's only a game with us until parties actually start signing it. Um, so, that of course, we can have right now this is an abstract discussion, and the most important is Stockholm University. While Stockholm University, Aston Mears might be positive to open access, Stockholm University, to the best of my knowledge, hasn't said that this is anything that you're going to try to enforce yet. Um, and I've, I would be surprised if Stockholm University starts enforcing that top down. Uh, the other deeper discussion, though, is that we had the previous question here about. What, why we should not allow hybrid journals. The problem is that hybrid journals thrive on the duality of the system, right? On the one hand, milking it with paid charges, but also getting these subscription fees. At any time, Bill, and I've been sitting and negotiating with, with you, and the first thing the publisher says, look at how important your researchers think this is. They publish in our journals. You just need to renew the subscription. By the way, we're increasing the price 15%. Um, and that is not sustainable. Sorry, because it is literally the same money that our salaries come from. Um, and at some point, we will have to choose. Um, and that's also why we need to reduce this cost. We need to find some way of drive the funding away from these publishers that have 50 to 60% profit margins, uh, because that, that per se is not good. And it is kind of a zero-sum game. It's not just a matter whether we, had it just been a matter of should we start enforcing these new complicated rules or not, then I think most of us would agree it's bad. But it's also long-term, it give, might give us more freedom. But I will leave it to you to say what you're going to enforce or not long term. <laughs> it's not a question about enforcing anything. Uh, I would just want to say that I don't feel very optimistic at all, but I feel especially pessimistic when I sit in negotiations with Elsevier and I see that we have absolutely no nothing to, to do to... Uh, prevent them from just increasing both the publication fees because this is fantastic. Now they can w make us pay both for subscriptions and for uh, our APCs. And this is absolutely unsustainable. So this is why I think that we have to do something to try to flip the system and to also regain control over our publications and our costs. So this is why I'm not optimistic, but I do hope that this might be a momentum where the, the uh, big publishers do listen. And, and 
understand that they also have to to change their system. So can I just follow up? I have one, I spoke with a colleague the other week about this, and there were vivid discussions about that. And he brought up another idea that should we go the Elsevier route instead and stop subscribing to all these journals? Because the journals that publish in the open access journals, anybody will be able to read their work, but we will just stop the subscriptions. Yeah, we discussed that as well in the BIBSAM consortium, I can say, without revealing too much. We had a question over here. Thank you. Oh, sorry. Uh, my, I raised my hand initially to ask if there were as a possibility to have more transformative agreements, uh, or if this is stopped now. Your indication was that this is stopped. You're not prepared to take up negotiations with further. This is one point. The other point, I think, is I'm not sure I agree about the hybrid journals, particularly not the ones for the learned societies, where, as was said earlier, the money that comes into the societies is not, it, they're not for profit organizations. We're not talking about predatory publishing houses. We're talking about groups of people who are like us, who run journals, who help young students go to meetings. They organize symposia. They provide travel grants. They're not milking us for nothing. And I think if we calculate the total cost of publishing in say, an American Physiological Society journal, it's not going to be a higher cost, including a fraction of the, the subscription cost, than it is behind a paywall of these for-profit open access journals that I think very often, as you very well know, are predatory. I think we need to clear a misunderstanding about transformative agreements first. Yes, them. of course. We will talk to all publishers about transformative agreements. We won't stop making them because um, I think that is really a way forward to make those agreements. Then we have to see after five years what's happened, what has happened with Plan S and with the hybrid journals and how it will look. And that we can't predict now, but we will still keep on making new deals with all publishers that want to make deals with us. But it must be a publish and read deal. That's why we haven't signed with Elsevier yet. And then a comment on the society publishers or learned societies. Yes, please. I can comment briefly. So first, I very much agree with you that there is a substantial difference between pure profit making and the societies. Um, and the other part of that is just because something is open access doesn't mean that it's high quality. It just means that it's open. And I think we all know a fair share of journals that use this as a way to just rake in profits too. There, there are two problems with the societies, I would say. Uh, in some cases, there might be a journal that is formally owned by a society, but they, they ent then entrust an external publisher to help them publish this journal. The problem is that that external publisher then goes to Wilhelm and sell this journal as part of a package and use that as an argument to extract very large subscription fees in Stockholm University. And then the problem is that while the original society's goal is, auto uh, is good and everything, it becomes part of the problem. The other thing, though, that I've seen for some of the larger societies that are so it's ACS that's large enough that they actually have their own publishing house, it's once it comes to negotiating prices, that's a fairly aggressive tactic there, too. I would not say that my impression is not that they're acting out of noble causes and just trying to advance science. It's very much that they want to maximize the revenue, possibly for good reason. But there, too, you're seeing, you're seeing the same type of double-digit percent increases as you do with the commercial publishers. Okay, so a new question from the audience. You have one back. Yes, over there, of course. I will run. Thank you for meeting me halfway. Yes. No Hi. Okay. okay. Uh, my name is Therese. I'm a PhD student at the uh, Department for Biochemistry and Biophysics. And I just have a comment. And that is, um, I mean, I belong to the internet generation. I believe that information wants to be free. You don't have to sell me an open access. But with this hard uh, implementation deadline, you are basically creating a uh, playing field without clear rules. So when I finish my PhD in a couple of years, I will come out to a world where you can't tell me what the rules will be. How am I supposed to adapt to that or plan my future, you know? 
Yes, the free Turkish. Sadly, visa. welcome to the club. I think it's been like that for two, 20 years. But um, part of that is what I, I'm not. I'm not the one thing I'm not happy. I think it's too accelerated. I would. I would act, had had open had plan S had a plan where they said that they want to force this from three years. So now they would. They might very well had me be way more positive about the whole thing. That is the one thing that I dislike, and I also dislike encouraging people to sign on to something we not know what it's going to be yet. Having said that, at some point in the future, you might also, like if there was an opening at the Swedish University, so is a professorship you could even apply to. And the way that these publication costs are going right now, the department that you might be interested in working on in the future might not be able to afford that position. And then you will certainly not get a job there. Yes. Where did we have the next question? Always. Hi, again. Uh, so first, just a clarification about the transformative deals again, because I'm, I'm, very, I'm getting very confused, because we have these 10 principles, we have the implementation document, and then we keep hearing all kinds of different things. But if we look at the implementation guidelines, it says here, transformative agreements that are planned as compliant, uh, a journal that is covered by a transformative agreement that has a clear and time-specified commitment to full open access transition. So that is required for it to be Plan S compliant. And if the Plan S architects say, say something else, they are actually lying because this is what's there in the document. So that is that. Uh, and, and this is for Astrid. You said that you believe that flipping the system would be beneficial for research and researchers. And I would wonder, can we think bigger? Can we, I know that there are initiatives out there that do not rely on paywalls, either on the reading side or the, or the, the uh, author side. So could we think of some kind of consortia solution? Is there any viable solution for funding for journals that do not require payment either from the author or from the reader? So universities, for example, going together in a coalition to fund journals. Is that something that you have thought about? Start with Willem and then Astrid, yes. Uh, today, we are helping a lot of those initiatives with money. Open Library of Humanities and SciPost and Knowledge Unlatched and others. And I think what you are raising is very important for the future because I think in the future we should have more of that. So we haven't, so we don't have to be reliant on the commercial publishers. But today, we are, we can't move that way that fast, but we still have to look at that way also. So we, I am very in favor of those initiatives. And uh, Astrid. Yes, so am I. I think that Plan S is a kind of technical, an attempt to flip the system uh, by offering this framework. But I think that the ultimate goal is much wider and I totally share what I understand to be your view that we should uh, move beyond hopefully also the read and publish model but I still think that we have to suppress the the now dominant subscription model and then if we succeed in that there will be plenty of room I hope to develop new forms of scholarly publishing so I, I uh, really uh, agree with you on that point. I would like to also comment upon the transformative agreements because it is clear that Coalition S acknowledges all existing transformative agreements. They do not have to comply to those uh, points that you mentioned. So the already existing agreements, they are accepted as such. For as long as they run. It depends on the length of the agreement, which is individual in each agreement. When I listen to this, I think it's a strange mixture of two different things here. One is one we all agree on, and that's, of course, that we cannot continue, I remember even the old days, uh, to pay more and more for, let's call it, journals, and now I mean in both ways. And there, of course, uh, it's difficult because our negotiation situation as a small nation and so is not the best. But, of course, we all want to keep the costs low. To me, it's not self-evident why coupling this to open access suddenly should make the companies less uh, money, uh, money interested. Uh, because if we have open access, 
you're still in the same negotiation situation that we have to actually pay for it. And it doesn't change really for the, that part, whether we pay one or the other. Of course, I would prefer a system where uh, less of our money went to paying for the journals. But it won't become cheaper because they're open access. It'll be exactly the same. They're equal, equally interested. And only if we have, let's say, good ways to put a pressure on the companies and the societies, they can keep it down. But open access is not a kind of solution to this. It's another thing. I think a big problem today is we are paying for the licensing for to read, and that is going up. Then we started the discussion about open access, and the publishers were really against from the beginning. Then they found a way to go to open access, and then we had the APCs. Today we pay twice. We pay both for reading and for publishing. And that, if we continue in that way, the licensing fee will go that way, and the APC's fees will go that way. We have seen it, of course. Then we have agreements where we combine the license fee and the publishing fee, and then we get control of it. Then it, the APC's can't go that way. But that's why we have to handle it. And uh, it is a discussion about open access, and I think that all persons think, not all, but many think that it is important to spread your research as far as you can and things like that in open access. So the debate now is about open access, but it's also about the costs for the scholarly communication that we have to stop. We can't continue with that. Uh, sorry, sorry. hold on. We will have another reply sure. uh, and then... I think you're quite back. right that open access is not necessarily connected to the cost, but, but of course two things that have appeared in parallel, right? And open access suddenly became a way for some publishers to get a whole lot of extra revenue. Um, I think the, the one part of this committee that... Seeing at this externally, to me, it seems fairly obvious that some of these publishers are turning very large profits. Uh, but maybe I'm also a firm believer in market economy, right? So maybe we shouldn't try to socialize them and tell them how to run their offices. But maybe this means we should start to compete with them and take a larger part of this publication in our own hands. Maybe starting using some of these Stockholm University funds to bolster SU Press, uh, maybe start more journals run by our, us and our colleagues and everything. Uh, because if it is possible to do this at substantially lower cost and higher quality, then we too should be able to do so. I'm not, in some cases, it's probably not possible. Um, some of the learned societies likely has a reputation and a scale that we can't compete with, and in that case, we probably shouldn't. Um, but this just might be a way that we could derive some benefit to it, both to Stockholm University and to ourselves too. Yeah, a reply, or you're, you're happy. Here you go. So I, I, I would want uh, the rector in particular to say something about uh, the, the research quality because uh, I think one of the fears from the research community is that Plan S will have a negative impact on, on quality. And of course, I mean, also when you look at the, uh, uh, the chart there, you see how much we pay for open access. And we think, uh, or you think, that it would be good to increase that part. I think it would be good to decrease it because open access journals are mostly crap, to be honest. And should be should not be we should not use Stockholm University money to go to, to, go to. I mean Frontier for example is a commercial uh, publisher yeah. enormous profits right yeah. and they are behind Plan S they are the one to stand to profit from all this and and what do they have they have almost ninety percent acceptance rates this is where we're heading right this is where Plan S is yeah. is is leading us. Well, we looked at where the researchers at Stockholm University are publishing in pure open access journals. And one of the publishers were Frontiers. And I won't debate Frontiers' quality. Um, I think that Plan S is not leading to the commercial open access publishers. Plan S is trying to get the commercial publishers to change their way. But Frontier is commercial. 
Yes, I know that front I, I don't debate frontiers. I say it's not only the commercials, publishers, pure open access publishers that will gain. I think Plan S is a way to move the other publishers to be open access. Uh, I share the idea, of course, that research quality is the most important thing in all this. But I would like to also remind us all that uh, the researchers, you, we, we are the ones who are actually publishing and we are peer reviewing and we are doing all the quality work for which the uh, some of the commercial publishers claim the fame. And that is exactly why I'm concerned in making them flip the system. Uh, of course, research quality is the most important thing and we should really also have a parallel war with predatory journals and all such things. Yeah, so I, I don't think we're going to end up in the worst possible scenario, but I'm also fairly confident that in particular if NIH, NSF and some uh, Asian societies don't sign on, we're definitely going to have some journals who decide to take their chances and not sign plan S. Um, on the other hand, looking at myself, if we get half of them or three quarters to flip, I think I, hopefully it's not going to happen from January 2020, but I think it would, it's worth some sacrifices. And if this means, say, that nature is no longer going to be an option for us to publish in, uh, if we get 90% of the journals in science to, uh, to flip, I think maybe that's an acceptable compromise. But uh, no, it's not going to be without pain. Okay. Uh, about your compromise there. So say we have a 75% take up or 60% or something high. So we will have a divided research community. So if we want to read what the other half or 30% is doing, we still have to subscribe to those journals and carry those subscription costs. And we have to pay APCs. So we will get a divided research community. And I don't think the cost is the biggest problem. It's that it's divided. I mean, research should be cum cumulative. We should build on each other's, read each other's research. So that is a huge problem, unless the uptake is like 100%, which is, I think, naive to believe. Uh, so um, I think that this, uh, we talked about this, uh, finding other solutions that do not require pay to publish. And I think this is the, the huge weakness. It's like uh, the plan S stops at pay to publish. They promote pay to publish. And there is nothing at all about how to take the step from pay to publish to a, a better option because pay to publish will, I mean, they will drive us to journals like Frontiers or, or the MDPI journals. They will drive us to those. And then how are we going? We have established that part uh, with those uh, uh, for-profit companies. How are we going to take the step to this other solution that we really want, where we don't pay to publish and don't pay to read? There is nothing at all about that in Plan S. So it's just like a, a hope that somehow that will come in the end. But there's nothing concrete there. Uh, maybe I'm ha hijacking somebody in the audience now, but we do actually have a funder that have signed Plan S present. Uh, so Lisa, I thought maybe you could just give a comment on the worries from the funder side on what you're doing during this transition period. Okay, uh, I'm uh, from Formas, the research council for the environment, uh, agriculture science, and spatial planning. And we, yes, we have signed uh, Plan S, and we are part of co the coalition. Um, there are <laughs> many worries, uh, and indeed we have had lots of, of uh, uh, um, debates, uh, uh, also uh, internal ones, and also, of course, uh, together with other funders. Uh, and I must say, uh, there it isn't quite true that that no researchers has been in, in uh, part of Plan S or Coalition S, uh, because in all our boards there are researchers, so they have, of course, been part of what the discussions. They? They have been part of the discussions, yes, concerning the board, the, the, part, the, the board has been part of of our decision to. Oh, okay. Yes, they've been part of. They they've been part. Of, they had said yes to to our agree to 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 coalition S and and plan S. Yes. <laughs> sure. Uh, could I please uh, continue? I'm just saying that that it, it still is is the the funders' uh, uh, decision, of course. But I'm just saying that there have, there is not. That's not true. That it hasn't been discussed with researchers. So anyway, um, 
we are, of course, uh, eager to to discuss things, and we have to. We had this hearing uh, um, last week together with the, the Research Council of Sweden, who hasn't signed yet. Uh, and uh, Formas and Forte have, uh, who also has signed uh, Plan S, have this consultation process now open until uh, February 8th, uh, as also Science Europe has. So we, what we are doing now is, is uh, we have, of course, uh, uh, seen the new uh, the guidance, uh, the impl implementation plan. We are trying to... Um, not, not trying, we are, are, are of course discussing how best to implement it, but we are also waiting uh, to have the results from the consultation process nationally and also internationally. So without that, uh, those comments, we, we will just wait and see uh, for what kind of uh, changes that will be, because there will be changes, I'm, I'm sure of it, although not concerning the principles. Uh, uh, but also the, the the actual technical guide, and they are, and they are technicalities. They have been discussed before. They are not new. I want to say that these these are not. There are no new principles. Thank you so much. Do we have a question over here? Thank you. Uh, I'm Barbara Wolfert. I'm Section Dean for Earth and Environmental Sciences. And my question actually is to you, what, what kind of guidance shall I give to young researchers, to postdocs and to tenure track assistant professors? Where shall, where shall they publish? What shall they do to get a good CV, a good publication list in the future? And don't publish in Frontiers. <laughs> I think we agree on the last statement. <laughs> uh, for the young researchers, I'm all with you. They should publish in the best possible journals they can get in. I think the challenge is where should you and I publish? So I think we might have to learn to compromise a bit because our careers are not going to die. Um, but the young researchers, they should not care about this. And that's why, that's why I think it's important for us as university, as departments, if that means that a young researcher has to publish in, say, Nature, well, we will probably have to find funding for that, even if it means taking from some sort of Stockholm University funding rather than external funding. Because, no, we should not sacrifice the young researcher on this altar. But you and I might have to compromise. Thank you. And over here we have a question. Yes. I'm Rodrigo Caballero. I'm a professor at the uh, Department of Meteorology. So I just I wanted to come back to this point, because if the funders stipulate that any funding that has been used to develop or obtain scientific results uh, or any scientific results that have been obtained using their funding can't be published in journals that aren't Plan S compliant, then that means that I can't publish in Nature, right? I mean, even if I pay for my own credit card, I'm not allowed because the postdoc or PhD student who produced the results was funded from v, well from Formas, for example, right? So they are actually not going to be able to publish in Nature, even if their result is groundbreaking and you know, and deserving of being published in Nature. Yes. So that's wrong. Um, it's very easy. What they can do is that Formas can say that. The funding you have from format, they do not consider the page, uh, the page charges in nature an eligible expense on your grant. But formats cannot tell you where you can and cannot publish. Yeah, oh, but it's, oh, it's very clear. Again, I'm not defending Plan S here, that, no. but that, that's actually what it says. The whole point is that the funders no, no, will no, be no, able no. to restrict. Yes, and that's up to, would you like to repeat yeah, so, that? So that's why I think you misunderstood what I said before. That's why I worry about the, also the law for, for uh, higher education. It said it should monitor and sanction non-compliance. Yeah, and that is, the, that is what it's... Just, sorry, we had a yeah, comment no, here. No, but this is just, I, definitely this, I have understood it, you can't. I mean, the, if I get money from farmers, I cannot publish in nature. That's very simple, and that's the end of that. So, uh, and, the, I mean, and the simple compliance is, of course, if I do it in any case, I may not be put in prison or anything, but I won't get my next uh, grant from Formas. 
I would just like to add, since the National Library of Sweden is in charge of the publication counting the output, that we have uh, 20 corresponding authors per year in Sweden in nature. So maybe not nature should be our biggest concern for whole planets. J just, uh, you know, so we keep to that. But there are many, there are many, there are many like that, many journals like that, high prestige journals. I was wondering here uh, whether our rector is not worried about what Eric says. I mean, if the senior professors here now stop publishing in the best journals, because we can, because we have our careers, right? It doesn't really affect us very much. Uh, rector won't fire us, we hope at least. Uh, but, the, but the quality of the output from Stockholm University will take a hit, right? We will, we will go down from 100 in the world to... 200 very rapidly, or 500 if the best researchers don't publish in the best journals. I think that yeah, this is a question, <laughs> it is a hypothetical question, because uh, Eric's uh, thought that he could afford not to publish in the best journals was a hypothetical question, given uh, that... Uh, Plan S is is, is uh, actually uh, implemented, and that so I, I I will not answer that question. To be honest, I think you can understand the answer. Of course, I'm concerned about the quality of Stockholm University and its research output, but I'm not uh, I'm not <laughs> that concerned about our exact position in the ranking lists. Uh, another thing I might add is also that uh, there is DORA, which is about another way of, uh, of evaluating and assessing scholarly output than only counting impact factors. And many of those, or those who have signed Plan S, have also signed DORA, which I think DORA is very much in alignment with uh, many of the discussions that I hear in our faculties and in the university leadership, how we should assess uh, research quality. It's not only by counting impact factors. Yeah, and I, well, I don't, I don't think it's entirely hypothetical, but of course, large groups, any group that gets a paper accepted in nature, they will find a way. Sorry, I can't imagine there's going to be a single group who gets a paper published in one of the top-ranking journals that will not find a way to, to fund it. Uh, one way or another will work. No, what I, what I said is that we have a way to compromise. For instance, I can, if I choose, we typically sit in, in, in the group and decide where we're going to try to send something. And of course, at some point, we should probably start sending more things to eLife and fewer things to PNAS because eLife is open. And they're roughly the same ranking, right? So that's a choice I can make. And that when I'm making that choice, having a slight nudge in the right direction, I think serves as good. But again, the page charges in nature or science, as you said, there are so few <laughs> papers like that per year, it's not going to eat us out of the bank. Um, then there is another, your comment before about exactly how we should interpret this compliance and monitoring. I interpret that as that when people, for instance, if journals are actually not following through with the flipping and everything, we can discuss that. But the problem there has to do, it's very unclear exactly what Plan S means. And that is a fair criticism. And that's also why I'm worried about enforcing it from January 2020. But in the interest of having an interesting discussion with them, I, think it, I don't think they're doing it out of evil or that they're trying to destroy the entire system. So I'll give them the benefit of the doubt until I see what it actually says. But I agree that it's not so well thought through. There is an odd situation when I care more about the freedom than you usually do. But that was internal. I thought since we have formats here, I, I would like to hear if there's any been... You have signed this document and it says in point 10, members of the coalition should monitor and sanction non-compliance. What kind of discussion do you have about what kind of sanctions you're going to impose on people who doesn't follow the rules? We are looking into it now. Uh, and of course, we have to have discussion with other funders uh, in Sweden and also in the northern countries as well as uh, more international. There are different kinds of ways. Um, we are not ready to say what kind of sanctions. Well, of course, there has to be some kind of sanctions, I guess. Uh, I want to say something clear. We will not enforce all these uh, the, the, um, uh, the requirements retrospectively or retroactively. It will probably be, uh, as we 
uh, have discussed um, will from January 21, uh, sorry, 2020, it will uh, probably uh, uh, affect the calls, I mean the, the, the grants or that are um, that we um, um, have from that from that year and that that gives you gives us at least two three years before any publication is is uh, will result from that kind of research. I also want to say that that the reason and why Formas and other funders have. Um, sign the plan is to 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 to, to uh, try a way to really have the, the pressure on the on the publishers to flip the system. That is why. I don't think you we will we will we'll, we'll just have to see what kind of. And I also want to say uh, concerning Dora. Dora is very uh, important uh, statement that that formas also have signed uh, and i guess perhaps it's it's easier for formas who is a research council that it's not just only of the scientific quality it's also the social societal relevance there are other ways to to evaluate research than just the the publications so when we, the evaluators evaluate uh the proposals they won't not look at the journal impact factor, but also on other kind of outputs. Yes. And with that, I actually think that we will round off by uh, thanking you all for such an engaged discussion and questions and leave the last word to Astrid. Well, I just want to thank you all for attending and for exactly as Anna said, for being so engaged in these important issues that we all face together these challenges so i think it's very good to have this kind of de academic debate so thank you very much